welcome to the Empathic Mastery Show. I'm your host, Jennifer Moore, and I'm so glad you're here. This is a place where we talk about what it means to be highly sensitive and empathic, how this impacts all aspects of our lives, and we explore tools, resources, and solutions so we can shift from absorbing all the thoughts, feelings, and energy of the world around us to being beacons for calm, love, and healing. So today, oh my God, you guys, oh my goddess, you guys, I can't even tell you how excited I am to be having this conversation because I'm talking to the amazing Perdita Finn and Clark Strand. They are the authors of this really glorious, gorgeous book. If you haven't heard of it, you got to go out and get it called The Way of the Rose. And not only did they write this book, The Way of the Rose, but they're also the co-founders of The Way of the Rose International Fellowship. So Clark and Perdita, thank you so much for being here. I am so delighted to have you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, so thanks, much. Jennifer. We're so happy to be here on your show. Oh, I am delighted. I, I, I'm like a kid. <laughs> I, I'm like, like a kid on Christmas Eve. So, talk to me. Talk to us about the way of the rose. And well, the subtitle of our book is "The Radical Path of the Divine Feminine, Hidden in the Rosary." Mm. And we like to say our fellowship is we're devoted to the lady by whatever name you want to call her. Here, here. <laughs> and so our book is really about recovering the European indigenous spirituality that was hidden in the rosary like magic beans and passed from grandmother, grandparents to their grandchildren undercover. Yeah. Um, you know, if you, our daughter Sophie describes the rosary as a uh, devotion to the mother goddess passed down over the centuries, hidden like a stowaway in the whole of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and one of the things that a lot of people don't know, because the church has done a really good job of trying to wrest it out of the hands of the grandmothers, is that the church, the rosary was a subversive goddess practice mm. that that for people, ordinary folk people, primarily women, engaged in sort of as a counterculture to the church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The church was always trying to control it, appropriate it, define it, rein it in. But if you go back into the Middle Ages when the rosary as we know it today mm -hmm. emerges, I mean, people are only nominally Christian. Yeah. And there's also, during the high Middle Ages, about a thousand years ago, this is the great peak of devotion to the divine feminine in the Western world, right? I mean, the modern Western world, like, the, you know, over the past few thousand years, you go back far enough and you get to these great mother goddesses that existed throughout the ancient world. And there was a, uh, a seasonal practice. We don't have any idea how old it really is. It goes back at least 5,000 years and probably two or three times uh, that, that far into the past of weaving uh, crowns of uh, usually roses, but other flowers when they were in bloom into chaplets, right? Mm. And uh, offering them in the beginning to one another. Uh, and then eventually, you know, as people settled down, began to build temples to the great mother, uh, they would offer them to the statues. And this practice was passed down for thousands of years uh, by, uh, you know, what the Christian church calls pagans. It's actually a very far-flung devotion to the earth goddess. And uh, eventually, this sort of merged with the, with the practice of repeating Hail Marys, and the rosary was born. What people are doing when they say their Hail Marys symbolically is they are weaving a verbal chaplet of flowers with their prayers. Mm. Mm. But these beads were known, you know, you talk about empaths. I, I, I know so many psychics who pray the rosary. Yeah. Not raised Catholic. I mean, neither Clark nor I was raised Catholic. Neither was I. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, you know, as I write about in the book. And we're not Catholic now. And we're not Catholic now. And neither <laughs> am I. <laughs> and we're not going to be. <laughs> um, uh, we have, a, we have a, our group, we say no priests or priestesses or property, you know, <laughs> no building funds. It's, it's just friendship. Yeah. Um, yeah. But 
the rosary is really a, such an interesting tool for empaths, and it was for women. It's a women's spiritual practice. Yeah. It probably, um, one of the things I found was really interesting when I started researching it was that I, you know, I spent some time in the Buddhist world doing, I was a Zen student. It's a very, ma meditation is a very masculine practice. Yes. And it probably has its origins in hunting behaviors, the need to be very still, the need to be very quiet, the need to be solitary, and you also have to be attentive. Like, mm -hmm. don't get distracted. If that antelope comes by, you got to get it. No chit-chat. No chit-chat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Contrast that with women, old women, young women, lots of kids around, gathering nuts and berries. They're picking which is the same gesture, that hand over hand gesture that we'll do when we're praying the rosary. And what are they doing? They're talking and telling stories. They're singing songs. They're amusing the children. The old people are sharing wisdom. And you can get distracted. You can have attention deficit disorder. And the rosary, <laughs> keep, you have to have attention deficit disorder if you're a woman because you have 10,000 things you have to keep yeah. track of. Yeah. And so the rosary, these bead practices become a way of guiding women through these communal experiences of song and prayer. Mm. And the rosary is also very tactile. I mean, meditation becomes this fairly disembodied practice where in most traditions, the object is kind of to forget the body, right? Or yes. To lose oneself in a particular bodily sensation, breathing or the heartbeat or whatever. But it's not a, it's not a very much of an embodied practice. Whereas the rosary is tactile. You're holding the beads through your fingers. You're moving your lips, you know, and, and it doesn't require discipline, you know, of a, uh, of an artificial nature, right? You don't have to sort of, you know, yank your you know, your mind back to attention because the, you just say a prayer on every bead. The beads guide you through the prayer. So it's like Our Lady takes you by the hand and says, now here's the next prayer, here's the next prayer, and then you get finish the circle and you're done. Mm, mm. It's yes. very, very yeah. simple and very easy. Easy to pick up, easy to easy to learn. You, you know, as you're speaking, you remind me of two experiences that I had when I was younger. One was taking my goddess daughter, who happens to also be named Sophia, oh. out into the field at a festival that we were at when she was like, she's now in her late 20s. And at the time, she was probably about six. And I took her out into the field to harvest St. John's wort flowers to make St. John's wort oil and tincture. And I taught her this tradition of, because when you make St. John's wort oil and, and tincture, you want to pick just the blossoms to really make it work. So it's a very meditative, mind, but, but joyful practice. And there was just that aspect of this lineage of being the older woman teaching the younger girl this tradition. And I knew as we were doing it that this would be a memory she would have for the rest of her life. And, you know, thinking about that heritage of these things. Whereas around the same time, I was in seminary and I was working with a male client who was a very um, devout, rather evangelical Christian, but mystical. So he would come and work with me for healing work. And I remember Recon recognizing his relationship to his body, that so much of the pain he was in had to do with the idea that he was trying, aspiring to separate from the body. And, to, and I had this experience of realizing, wait a second, the truth is the embodiment, not the separation. And you know, we were talking before we jumped on about how these last 2,000 years, the, tr the transmission of the Magdalene kind of got lost. And that idea of the marriage of the, of the heaven and earth and the marriage of the body to the divine spirit got, got sort of separated. And I love how the rosary brings us back to that union between spirit and form. Well, it really does it very literally. Yeah. One of the things that's interesting about the rosary is it alternates two prayers. 
the our father called the potter or that's the latin word for father yeah and the hail mary which is the mater and by the way there are five our fathers and there are 50 hail marys just so it's clear who's in charge yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes. but <laughs> that said um it's a very interesting mantric rhythm the rosary offers because the the hill the our father is this kind of i always say it's the marriage of sunlight and water and mud and earth mm. as the mother the mother of the planet is water and rock and earth right and it's going to create life but it needs one ingredient it needs the sunlight you take blue water and golden sunlight and you get green life mm. and oh. that's the alchemy to create that we do with the rosary yeah. we are praying the creation of life so that that uh those two prayers the, which are the two basic prayers of the rosary the our father and the hail mary they really reenact the heroes gamos right they are yes. the enactment of the divine marriage right yes. the, the sacred union and so in praying the uh the rosary we're really reenacting that alchemy and that one our father sort of the our father is a very pretty dog always calls it the hunter gatherer prayer it was really just about having enough for today getting along with everyone living lightly on the earth you know not taking you know not, not, being, a creep. <laughs> not being a creep not being violent you know not taking uh not accumulating surpluses of money or 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 grain or power or whatever and but it but it's a very uh conscious prayer right it brings us up to it elevates our consciousness uh, you know, up and brings it up into the light. The Hail Mary is a very dark prayer, dark in the, in the, in the sense that the night is dark and soft and, and, and silent and deep. And it's it the darkness us, of the water. Yeah, the darkness of the womb, the darkness of the tomb, darkness of the water and of the earth itself. And so those 10 Hail Marys, which are basically a mantra because they're repeated back to back, they take us into a very, very, very deep womb-like place. And mm -hmm. we come up out of that with the Our Father and the and we go back down. So it's really like, we sometimes describe it as being, you know, saying the rosary is being whale-like. You know, you come up for air, and then you dive deep for those mm. 10 Hail Marys. Then you come back up, you take a breath full of air and sunlight, you know, and then you dive back down. And the, the effect of that repeated diving and surfacing uh, on consciousness is that it's like we cross over the veil. Like we, yes. we cross... We cross over and come back. We cross over and come back. And I think that's the reason why so many psychics, uh, like John Edwards and many, many psychics, yeah. talk about praying the rosary, especially George right before Anderson. A, George Anderson, right before a session. Right. Yeah. And also, I don't know about you, Jennifer, but for me, one of the things that helps, I often find I'll go into very deep spaces when I'm mm -hmm. doing mm -hmm. it. Almost like liminal, dreamlike spaces yeah. while I'm away. Yeah. Sometimes I'm almost have the experience of falling asleep and coming out of it with inside of the prayer. The rosary is a dreaming prayer. It's, it's mm -hmm. it really takes you into dream space. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Oh, there are so many different directions we could go with this. No. <laughs> what what I want to say is that I've. I don't know if you guys have had this experience, but I was telling you before that the rosary, the first rosary, well, actually, it's not the first rosary I ever got, but the first rosary that really grabbed me is a rosary that had been my dearest friend's uncle's rosary that she got for him at the Vatican like over 20 years ago. And what I'm experiencing is that it is like a phone where I am connecting to the person who prayed it before me. And I am now starting to have these experiences where he, because he started talking to me five or six years before, from the other side, five or six years before he finally got the rosary in my hands. But he had started talking to me through this rosary 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. I, we can tell you, it, we recount in our book incredible miracles we've had with rosaries that have come oh, yeah. to us. Yeah. Yes. And I know I have two rosaries and I pray with them because one is for my daughter and one is for my son. And I am filling them with prayers that will go to them and then go to my grandchildren yeah. and then my great children. Yeah. It, rosaries that come, they hold, those beads hold the it's prayer. It's intensely personal. They 
session. Oh, it is so intimate. It is so intimate. And um, I know that this rosary will go to the son of my, of my friend, and it will have all of the mysteries that Louie and I have been bringing through. Oh, yeah. And when, oh, he's, when he's like 40 or something and I finally cross over, this will go back to that family. And then the rosaries and the chaplets that I've been making will be going forward to the great nieces and great nephews that will be, that, that hopefully will come in my family. And there is so much of a sense of the legacy of a well-made rosary and, well, and here, how it carries forward. <laughs> I want to tell one story. I want Clark to yes. tell it because this will give you. We're, we have three non Catholics here praying the rosary, yeah. absolutely devoted to it in our lady. Yeah. And we have thousands of them, thousands of people like us. I once said, Where am I going to meet any other non Catholic ex Buddhists who pray the rosary? And now I have thousands of friends <laughs> like that here. <laughs> but here's really interesting Clark had a moment when he started praying the rosary. Southern, raised Southern Presbyterian, ex-Zen mm. master that he was. And he said, I don't have any right to pray the rosary. Yeah. Mm. And he said, let him tell you the story of what yeah, I our talk, late I, I talk about this in the... Uh, uh, tell the short chapter, version. Uh, well, there's a, there's a chapter in the book called The Boy Drawer. Yes. And, um, you know, I, I was... I, I still, like... I, I, I would... I would People were constantly coming up to me and saying, will you teach me the rosary? And I was like teaching the rosary. I would give rosaries away. Every, as soon as I'd get a rosary, I'd end up giving it to somebody. But in the midst of all of this, and then starting, you know, starting Way of the Rose with Perdita and everything, I still, part of me thought, you know, you're not really entitled to this. Like, you weren't born Catholic, right? It wasn't passed down to you in your family. You're, you're appropriating this, right? Now, if I'd gone back, you know, even a couple of generations, it turned out, you know, I, I would have found rosary prayers among my ancestors, but I didn't really think that way. So anyway, I uh, fall asleep one night and have a dream. And the dream, my, or, or I'm sorry, my mother had called me the week before and she had said, your grandmother is 102 and she needs to go into assisted living. So if you want anything from the house you grew up in, uh, as a boy, you should come and claim it now, right? So I was d debating, should I should I make the journey to Arkansas to this little tiny town to my grandmother's house? Anyway, I fell asleep one night in the midst of this, trying to make this decision, and I had a dream. And then the dream, I go with my mother into my grandmother's house, and I go straight to the kitchen to what I used to call the boy drawer. It was where a Josephine, my nanny, kept all of my toys when I was a boy. We would walk into town to Benjamin Franklin's five and dime store and I would buy toys and bring them back and they would go in this drawer. When I finished play with them, they go back in the drawer. So I go with my mother in the dream. I open the drawer and the only thing in there, not my toys of my childhood, but is a rosary, this rosary actually. Mm. And uh, it's a black, you know, onyx and sterling silver rosary. And I put it in my pocket and I say, that's all right. This is all I, this is all I need. Tell my mother that. And then the dream's over. So I called, I told my little sister this dream. I felt very comforted by it. I didn't need to go to the house, it turned out. I had the rosary. So about two weeks later, I decide, you know what? Jonah, my son, Perdita taught him the rosary when he was two years old, one year old, right? She was saying it the whole time. So he doesn't, there's no part of him that thinks just because he's not Catholic, he doesn't deserve the rosary, right? Because he grew up with it. So I think I'm going to order a really nice old style rosary on eBay and I'm going to pass it down to Jonah so he won't have to go through this. So I find one, I order it, and then I get an email the next day that said, your package has departed from Wynn, Arkansas, which is 12 miles away from Forest City, where my grandmother lived and where I grew up. <laughs> Not only that, it's where my great-grandmother and my great-uncles, all of the Ellis's, right, are from. This is a town the size of a postage stamp. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's a little smaller than a postage stamp. And so I'm thinking, this, this is just too bizarre. So I take advantage of this eBay feature, and I contact the, uh, the vendor. And she tells me that her name is Rose France. 
formerly <laughs> Rose Clark of <laughs> Forest City. <laughs> And she tells me that she was the toy and cotton candy girl at Benjamin Franklin Five and Don, where I bought oh all God. of the toys for, for the boy drawer, right? Oh. So I asked her, you know, I said, how old are you? But, you know, I said in the book, you know, I, I needn't have bothered. By that point, I knew this had her lady's fingerprints all, all over it, right? Yeah. She yeah. says, oh, well, yeah, I'm five, I'm, I'm, I'm 10 years older than you. So I would have been... I would have been the girl who sold you your toys. <laughs> right. And right. so the rosary came from her. And after that, I said, all right, lady, you win. I deserve the No, rosary. but it turns out, keep going. He uh, f- talks to her a little longer and oh, finds out right. she's related to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. So, so she's she, a blood relation. That's right. So I, when, when the rosary <laughs> finally arrives, I unwrap it. Of course, it looks just like the one in my dream. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Like dream. And, uh, and it, the return address is Ellis Avenue. And so I contacted Rose again. I said, you live on Ellis Avenue. You know, my my, uh, great-grandmother was in Ellis. And she says, uh, yeah, I'm descended from James Ellis, which meant that we were, in fact, related. Wow. So it was passed down to me and my family. (laughs) I have have some teachers who always said, one of the things they always say is, you can't make this shit up. Right. I know. (laughs) (laughs) And it's just, it, it's the miracles that start unfolding. I've actually been adding to my, my rosary prayers, um, you know, help me to behold the miracles unfolding even more clearly. Allow me to see the miracles that are unfolding. That is so beautiful. I'm going to add that to my rosary as well, if you don't mind. Oh, please. My daughter talks about this a lot. She says we need to re-enter the realm of the re- miraculous. We absolutely the do. And we are miracle. we are on we are in the realm of the miraculous right now. You know, it's sort of like we can either choose to be in the realm of the miraculous or we can choose to be in the realm of fear. Exactly. <laughs> you decide. <laughs> what, right. what do you want? You know? Beautifully put. Yeah. It's really beautifully put. And it was so interesting as you know, my daughter, we write about this in the book, has had, you know, a, a long term illness and yes. did a lot of doctors and stuff. And she finally said to me, you know, these doctors don't know how to engage in the theater of miraculous healing. Mm-mm. Yeah. They only have tests and answers. Yeah. And we want something, and, and we're learning that right now. Yeah. yeah. We're yeah. learning that we need a different kind of protection. And we've experienced miracles. I mean, miracles of healing uh, with her at various times, you know, like they would say that she had, you know, gone into liver failure, kidney failure, something was wrong with her heart. And we would go to this one sh- shrine to St. Anne near our house and we would pray and leave an offering. And then we would say, do the test again. They do the test again. The numbers would come back normal every time. Mm. The doctors don't say, you know, praise the Lord <laughs> or whatever, you know, or praise the goddess or play, praise our lady. That's not part of their real sphere, right? That doesn't. That's not a possibility. So they say, oh, the first test must have been wrong. And I feel like saying, yeah, the last five first tests were all wrong. I mean, yeah. how does yeah. that work? Yeah. Their, their reality doesn't accommodate that. Well, and it, you know, it fits in in some ways with the, with the mindset of meditation versus the mindset of the rosary in the sense that, you know, the allopathic system is always looking for the one cause. And if there's one thing I have found over the years working as a healer is that there is never just one cause. It is this confluence of things that come from the past, the present, the future, that are affecting us physically, emotionally, spiritually, and that it's never simple. And, you know, it's, and in a way, it's like that, that the meditation practice of getting still and focused really fits with the same kind of way that they, people approach medicine now, which is this idea that there's the one thing. And it's, it's, we have to embrace the mystery of, of the process. Right. And, you know, right now we're being confronted by this virus that's very wily. Yep. Wily. Wily. Yeah. It, it presents all different ways. It has all different kinds of manifestations. It's sneaky. It's, it, you know, we have to become more resilient, more sensitive. 
And lungs, in my experience, lungs and grief are deeply connected, yeah. deeply connected. And I've lately, I've just been feeling the waves of sorrow and grief and fear. And I've been realizing the only one who can handle this is Our Lady of Sorrow. That this is a, this is, we need to offer our sorrows to her feet. And we and need to feel, and we need to feel it. We yeah. do. We must grieve. We must grieve, and she can carry it. I mean, she she can, she can carry it. Um, you know, once I'll never forget, she appeared uh, at our one of our in-person Way of the Rose meetings and told people that she was going to send elephants to carry away their burdens. No, and oxen. Sorry, oxen to carry oxen. away their burdens. Oh. Okay, and so she asked everybody to pile on their grief and their sorrow. Yeah, load your load all of your griefs and sorrows onto my oxen. They will carry them away. And everybody felt very, very relieved. And then later I said to her, I said, Lady, the things you showed me that you called oxen were tiny. They were like the size of gnats. And she said, well, I could hardly have told people that my gnats will carry away all their sorrows because that doesn't seem like the gnats would be able to carry such a terrible burden like that. And I said, but, but how did the gnats, you know, carry away that much sorrow? And she said, you know, the things that you are burdened by are actually very light to me. I only need gnats to carry them away. Oh, is that oh. beautiful? Well, in our resistance to the grief is so frequently the thing that keeps us from that that keeps it and 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 like amplifies it. That exactly, you know, that yeah. we have a whole we have a whole section in our book called this Valley of Tears. Yes, which is about what gives us the courage to really look at the sorrow in our world and not turn away from it. And for me, it's holding her hand mm -hmm. and knowing mm -hmm. that she's got this. I don't have to solve the problem. No. I just have to bear witness. Yeah. Right. And acknowledge it. You know, it's our job is not to suffer through it. Our job is, but our job is to recognize and release it, to acknowledge it. One of the really interesting parts of the rosary is it's not just a mantric practice like other malas. It tells a story. Mm -hmm. And it tells a story of birth, death and sorrow, and resurrection and reunion. Yes. And you do these three circles, like the, the spirals, the triple goddess spirals, and you move through joy, you claim it, and then you enter the sorrows. And then the sorrow, you pass through them. You don't get stuck anywhere. Yeah. And that's the really interesting thing about the rosaries. It teaches you how not to but, get stuck. But you do it with your fingers. So it's like a somatic, it's almost like a, you, you recently said it was, it was like a form of somatic therapy because yes. while you're reciting these joys and sorrows and glories and going through this cycle endlessly, your fingers are moving and your lips are moving and you're rehearsing this, this, this rite of passage that all human beings go through. And, and so that, you know, when you encounter this in life, you aren't, you know, destroyed by it or flummoxed by it. Right, or, right. Well, and it prepares us for our death in yeah. the sense that it acknowledges that it's an inevitable part of living. Yeah. It yeah. is. And it is, by the way. There's yeah. nothing that doesn't die. You know, the, Stars yeah. die. Solar systems die. Mountains die. There is no human being who doesn't succeed at death. Right. We'll talk a little later about the Hail Mary, well, I think. Maybe we, we, should, should, right maybe we should talk about it Yeah, now. let's talk about it right now. The, the yeah. Hail Mary, which is the central prayer of the rosary in the, in the beginning, a thousand years ago, that, that was the only prayer of the rosary. It was just recited mm. mantra, you know, 150 times. But uh, the, the Hail Mary charts the course of a soul from the womb to the tomb, after yes, which does. it began, right? And it has these three parts there's uh, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Well, what's really sneaky about the Hail Mary, and here we go to the sneaky fun stuff we hide in our book, and there's a <laughs> lot of it. <laughs> there's a lot of Da Vinci Code secrets. Mm -hmm. Hail but Mary. Better than Da Vinci Code. <laughs> Way better. <laughs> Way better. <laughs> Way better. <laughs> yeah. The Hail Mary was really interesting. This isn't a prayer that was dictated by priests and given mm -mm. to people. It arose from the lips of women and men who had been worshiping and devoted to the goddess in their villages for 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Many times they took the statues of Isis 
and rename them Mary. Yeah. 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 And that's it. So they, there are three parts to the Hail Mary. They create this prayer. Out of, out of, out of the stuff of Christian legend. Out of yeah. the stuff of Christian legend. And the first part of the prayer says, Hail Mary, the Lord, full of grace, full of grace. Full the grace. Lord is with thee. Yeah. Okay. And that's just a traditional mantra. Hello, come here. Yeah. But interestingly, the lady is with the Lord. Mm -hmm. it's the lady and her consort. Yeah. Oh. The maiden and her lover. Yeah. Mm. It is it is that beautiful waxing moon that's coming into its power. It's that 17-year-old girl who can do anything. And we see that girl in those, you know, virgin by the way, never meant sexually pure, mm -mm. Meant sexually independent and sexually powerful. Yeah. I heard the translation, woman unto herself. Woman yes. unto herself, exactly. Very and we th if you think of a virgin forest, yeah, a virgin forest is fecund, mm -hmm. fertile. Powerful, po self-sustaining. Self-sustaining, yeah. alive. Yeah. And that's yes. that. Hail Mary, full of grace, full of life, full yeah. of possibility. Yeah. The Lord is with thee. And I sometimes think of those Tibetan paintings of the, you know, the God and Goddess in Congress together. That's what we're invoking. Yeah, it's it's the divine union right there. And if you look in medieval art, you know, the angel Gabriel plays the male part in those paintings. <laughs> he comes and he goes down on one knee, and this reenacts the moment when he's saying, Ave Maria, Glatia plena dominus tecum. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. That's what he says to Mary. That's the moment, right? Mm -hmm. Then she she immediately, after she hears, you know, after she accepts the inv invitation to give birth, to bring forth life from within herself on her own terms, she immediately goes into the hill, hill country north of Judea where the angels told her her much older cousin, Elizabeth, is pregnant. And when Mary walks in, the baby, John the Baptist, in Elizabeth's womb, leaps at the sound of her voice, right? The, the life within Elizabeth leaps, and she says the second part of the Hail Mary, which is the first part's the maiden, the second part is the mother. Yeah. Holy Mary, uh, Hail Mary, full of grace, Lord, <laughs> blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. That's what Elizabeth says to Mary. So that's yeah. the second part of the Hail Mary. And that honors the full moon mother mm -hmm. part of the mm -hmm. triple goddess. Yes. Elizabeth is fully pregnant. But that. those two yeah. parts of the Hail Mary come from scripture the gospel of luke mm. the last part of the hail mary comes from folk tradition yeah mm. and this is what people knew they knew that mary was bigger than even this one particular incarnation yeah yeah and they said holy mary mother of god and mother of god by the way the church tried to get rid of that term mm. and the people in Ephesus, rioted. Yeah. yeah. They rioted. And you do not take away our mother of God. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. They've been mm -hmm. worshiping mm -hmm. Diana for, you know, at least a thousand years already. And you take, you take, you take, you want to talk about a Buddhist koan, you take the biggest thing you can think of God and introduce his mother. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and you make it earthy. Hail Mary, you know, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us now. And at the hour of our death. That's the crone. So you've got the maiden, the mother, and the crone in this prayer, enshrined in the prayer, like a statue. It's right there. So the the triple goddess is enshrined within the central prayer of the rosary. And this is a secret that is hidden in plain sight. Yes. No Catholic church, no, no Catholic, uh, you won't hear it in any Catholic church, you won't hear any Catholic priest say this. But but the, no one needs to say it. It's the most obvious thing in the world. It's right there in the prayer. You know, right. So, right. And it's very comforting. I mean, the thing is, uh, it is an incredibly, like you said, it's, it gets us ready to die. It does. It's mm -hmm. a rehearsal mm -hmm. for, 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 for it's, it's a reenactment of birth, death, and rebirth. So it's a rehearsal. Yes. yes. And once, it is, like all mantras, once you finish it, you just start it again. <laughs> it's exactly. lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. So we're rehearsing the drama of coming and going from this world eternally. I sometimes say, you know, what would, how, how do I do, how do I want to die if I get a choice? <laughs> and I think, you know, surrounded by my grandchildren praying the Hail Mary with yeah, me. Mm. A lot of people traditionally did die. Yeah. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Well, and I, I was saying to a friend um, just earlier yesterday, we were talking and I was saying, you know, we are, I think part of our challenge in this culture is our denial of death, but also we, our relationship to death is death porn. We oh, watch uh, yeah. all kinds oh. of scary movies. We yep. watch all kinds of horror and all yep. of the messages about death are that one, it's an insult and that it's unexpected and that we are being defeated by it, which is the most absurd concept. And two, that, you know, that it has to be scary. And it is so sad to me that we are living in a time where all of the, most of the information about dying is this information that is making it, it's a, it is blasphemy. It's a perversion of what death is. You yeah. know, that is the most, I, I could not agree with Definitely. you more. Yeah, and I, you know, exactly right. What, what, we, we once Clark and I are fascinated by AA, and we said, what is the sobriety of the rosary? What does rosary sobriety look like? Mm. And it teaches you to live in the long story of your soul. Yeah. Mm. We don't have one life to work with. Yeah. Mm -mm. It's just, there is no mercy in the short story. There's no explanation in the short story but you have enough we all have enough life to work with yeah. yes and and we don't life know goes on and on that's the mm -hmm. lesson mm -hmm. of the rosary and the rosary teaches you that viscerally to feel the layers of lifetimes within you yeah. yes yes and when you are working with a rosary that comes from somebody who worked with it oh. before, oh, yeah. and the veil between the living and the dead start to get really thin, it really reinforces that continuity of life. And just, I mean, as you were saying too, it's like we start with the joyous mysteries, we go to the sorrowful mysteries, and then we come back to the glorious mysteries. We do, and it's, it's, it's just, um, you know, if there was anything I would want to teach people is that you don't have to be so frightened. Ah, mm. oh, amen. Preach it, sister. I mean, I mean, you know, I, the dead are right here. All the dead are ready to help you. Our lady said, when she first invited Clark to pray the rosary, she said, if you rise to pray the rosary tonight, a column of saints will support your prayer. And that, it's been an unfolding exploration of that column yeah. of saints. But what it is, is all the dead are beneath our feet. Yeah. They are there. Yeah. And they are there literally supporting us. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. are praying with us, for us. And you you feel that you feel that you, they become awakened when you yeah. pray the rosary. Yeah. Well they and do. they're encoded in our DNA. That's yeah. Right. We carry them in our DNA. And that's one of the things as I was writing the book and researching that I was finding was we carry the memories, we carry the trauma, we carry the, the legacies in our DNA from our ancestors. So they are of us. We, we, they're, they're, they're not just, we're not just standing on them. We are them. We exactly. carry, we carry exactly. their courage and their wisdom as well. Exactly. And especially right now and people are, you know, stuck at home and they're so, you know, frightened, you know, mm. You know, because I think by the time this is all over, you know, certainly, you know, most of us will still be alive, but we will probably know somebody who's died by the time it's all over, right? Yes, and, yes. and it may be someone in our family. And so there's a tremendous amount of fear. But the, the ancestors are there to guide us. Like my, I was praying the other day during my rosary to my the grandmother that I talked about who had to move in to assisted living at 102. She lived on her own <laughs> until 102. Okay, she had six husbands all of whom died, you know, eventually. She outlived all of them. She had a very long life, and she survived two pandemics. Oh. Okay? The Spanish flu yeah. and, the, uh, uh, and a, the, the smallpox epidemic, both of which she survived. Mm -hmm. So I prayed to her, and I said, you know, Ganny, uh, <laughs> how about a little help here right now? You know, just sort of steady us and, you know, keep us safe and keep us prudent and, you know, not, not frightened, but, but also, you know, uh, exercising care, you know, concern for our family and, and for others. Yeah, I felt really comforted by that. I felt I could feel her there saying, oh, yeah, yeah. fine. I've been realizing that we are all the survive. We are all the progeny, the descendants of people who survived the who have survived other pandemics. 
because oh, that's right. Because if we if we if we didn't have an ancestor who survived the pandemic, we wouldn't be here. And there's right. such an incredible like there is we are we are made of resilience. You know, we've got about 14, 15 minutes left on this interview. And I I feel like one thing I'd love to talk about just a little is touch on the elephant in the room, which is that whole piece of the resistance that some people have to the idea of either because they're so separated from Christianity and from the Catholic Church that they're like, I don't want to have anything to do with this, or that... Um, you know, the, or the people who are sort of looking at it as idolatry and, you know, just, could you speak to just the inclusion of the rosary, the welcoming of the rosary? Well, here's the thing. There were, there was a, the most popular story in the middle ages, the most popular tale that was told in every country all over goes something like this and the version of it. Somebody comes to the gates of heaven and Peter says, you're not getting in. And the person, you know, X, Y, and Z, here are the rules, reasons why you're not getting into heaven. As they're walking away, Our Lady says, over this way, and shows them a window that's wide open. <laughs> and it, it, that version of the story is told yeah. again and again and again. And basically what she says is, these rule makers, it's all been a game of who's in and who's out. Right. And I, and, and I include everyone. Nobody gets left out. That's mm -mm. my only read. Mm-mm. Mm -mm. We all, she is the mother of all life. She is everybody's mother. Mm. Everybody's mother. You know, absolutely. People, people today, uh, because the Catholic Church sort of hijacked the rosary uh, in modern times and would use it like as a weapon and turn it against women, for instance, you know, to pray the rosary to end abortion or pray the rosary to defeat communism or they, you, they politicized it. You know, they, they made it a, an anti-feminist tool, but the rosary certainly throughout the vast, you know, majority of its history was anything but that. This was devotion to the divine feminine. And if you go back a thousand years to the time when the rosary was taking shape and spreading all across Europe, the Mary legends, she is healing people. She is intervening in people's lives. She is behaving like a wise, fearless, courageous, loving, forgiving, tolerant mother. And Jesus and God are nowhere to be seen in these stories. <laughs> like, they don't even make a cameo appearance, usually. Our lady's just there answering prayers and performing miracles. And every once in a while, someone says, put in a good word for me with your son. And she says, will do. Right, right. right. Well, it's like dad is sleeping in. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> While mom exactly. makes breakfast. And it that's just, it. That's it just, a summary yeah. of just about every medieval miracle story in the canon right yeah. there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just to end with idolatry, <laughs> idolatry is a way of becoming disembodied. Yeah. Mm. Of, of, you know, you, you won't, you're not supposed to worship statues. Those are idols, right? Right. But those statues that people made for tens of thousands of years, and they were all women's bodies, yeah. and they all were different shapes, Talk all different paleo, sizes, paleo with it. Those idols yeah. were made to hold in your hand. Yeah. Yes. And you held Our Lady in your hand, just the way you hold a rosary, and in holding her, you felt safe. You yes. know, she held you. Yes. And so to take away people's idols is to take away what is our first gesture as a human being? It's to hold on to our mother. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we, we, we need those idols back. I see her, your beautiful Mary behind you. Isn't she and, beautiful? <laughs> and we become so, we, we, our house is filled, filled with Marys. Mine yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what? Yeah. It's about recovering the body. Yeah. Not just of our bodies as human beings, but recovering our devotion to the body of the earth. Yeah. Oh, so beautiful. So as we are circling in on the last 10 minutes, I know we talked about sharing some of your practice and sharing the, sharing the way you guys pray. And obviously we don't have time to pray an entire rosary and probably some people would, would, you know, find that a little excessive on our on an interview. <laughs> so I would, but I'd love to talk about and have you guys share with me and with us about this. Well, if you hold a rosary by the loop and you hang it down, and it ha if it has a cross on it, you will discover 
that it makes the symbol for women, for women. Yes. The ancient yes. symbol for Venus. And that's not coincidental. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's on purpose. Mm -hmm. But this little area is what often called the pathway that the leads the, part that the hangs pendant, down. the pathway to the garden. And there are three Hail Marys that you stay as a kind of rehearsal before you go into the garden. And they're kind of a spell. People often say, I often say to people, what's the difference between a prayer and a spell? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's who's deciding <laughs> which words. And the Hail Mary is a spell in which we're calling on Mary to show up in our lives and help us. It's a summoning us. spell. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And medieval people clearly understood it this way. They they experienced, they would say this prayer in the presence of a statue, usually, and they were calling the presence of Our Lady out of that statue before them to answer their prayers. So I would like us all to think of something we really need help with, personally, just to hold it in our hearts. And we begin by calling on the column of saints. And the first bead is for our ancestors. Our, our biological ancestors, our mothers and fathers back through time, but also our karmic ancestors, those mothers and fathers from lives we've forgotten. Our animal ancestors, our plant ancestors, mm. our mountain ancestors, mm. and we offer and call forth their help at this time mm. with a Hail Mary. Hail, Hail Mary, Mary, full, full of, of grace, grace, the Lord is, is with thee. thee. Blessed, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. womb. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, God pray for us now, now the hour of our death. death. Amen. Amen. And the second bead is for our descendants. Can, can we pray for all those beings who will come after us, for our own future mm. incarnations, for our biological children, our karmic children, for all the beings that will come into this world and remember us as their ancestors. Hail Mary, Mary full, full of grace, grace, the Lord is with thee. thee. Blessed, blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Holy Mary, Mary Mother of God, all, pray for us now and at the hour of our death. death. Amen. Amen. And last, we call forth our helpers among all the living allies in both the seen and unseen world, from all the animals and plants singing up to help us, to the beings we can't even understand, the angelic beings, the beings both too small and too big, even the microbes within our own bodies that keep us healthy. Hail Mary, Mary full, full of grace. Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And every morning, that's how Clark and I start the day and start. Mm. 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 I I noticed that you your prayer, there are slight variations from the traditional Catholic Hail Mary. And it reminds me of something that um, one of my teachers said many years ago that I have adopted from her, which is that there is no wrong way to do this. And that it's, it's not about being perfect. It's not about the idea of having it down by rote. It's about praying mm. prayerfully. We have two mottos on Way of the Rose. One is, make it work for you. Yes. You know, don't let a word get in the way yeah. of saying the rosary. Right. And the other is, there's no rosary police. It's a private experience. Yeah. It is yeah. so intimate. There's no priestly oversight. There's no one looking over your shoulder saying, do it this way, not that. But interestingly, you know, the, the Hail Mary, the way we just recited it, uh, it leaves out the word Jesus and the word sinners. Those two words were actually added in by the church. Not, by the, well, not just by the church, but the popes. <laughs> popes sort of bribed people into adding Jesus onto the prayer. In the beginning, it was just Hail Mary, full, the, the whole Hail Mary. The second part didn't exist in the beginning. It was just Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, period. Period. Like everybody understood that. Mary was older and bigger than Christianity or the church. This was the mother goddess who gave birth to every, the fruit of her womb is the entire planet. Yes. Everyone yes. Was. It was the, it was the, the fruit of the fields, right? It was, it was uh, the animals giving birth. It was the fields coming, flowers coming back into bloom. 
it was the food that they ate, everything. So, mm. so actually, oh. if you go back far enough, you get to a version of, of the rosary <laughs> that is actually a great deal more enlightened than the one the Catholic Church preaches today. <laughs> Speaking of which, should we do uh, the Hail Mary in Latin? Please. Sure. Now, one of the things we found people do is that sometimes language, people like to do the languages that they've learned, the Hail Mary in Gaelic or Catalan or Italian. Um, and one thing is most of our answers in the Middle Ages would have probably said it very like a mantra. You know, we're used to mantras in our yoga studios, but we don't really expect Kali and Shiva to show up. <laughs> <laughs> but... But People but Indians did. do. Yeah, I was going to say I think that depends on who you are, actually. <laughs> no, I was going to say. I mean, I was thinking of Western Americans in their yoga studios. Yeah, I was not right. thinking of you know. Yeah, yeah. the the the, the spandex yeah. yoga pants version of That's yoga. What I was talking yeah. About. yeah, yeah. But the Hail Mary is a it's a some these are summoning charms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you when you were reciting the Kali mantra, the Shiva mantra, you're expecting them to show up. Mm -hmm. And. One way to get around issues you might have is to do it in Latin. Clark will do it. In mm. Yeah, Latin. Uh, some, 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 some. A lot of people, I, we we found are more comfortable with the Latin version. We have people who do the rosary in Latin, not because they're traditionalists or anything like that, but just because they want to enter that realm of pure sound. So this is the rosary in Latin. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui. Eh, eh, wait a minute. <laughs> we, what, you're not going to sing it for us? I thought you were going to sing oh, it. Oh, okay. Well, I'm used to singing it. So. We said, uh, okay, if he sings yeah. it. That's yes, yeah. yes we've, got, we've got three minutes, so okay. sing it. you got some time. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Santa Maria, Mater Dei, Ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostre. Amen. Oh, that's the I one needed the, that. That's the one the ancestors <laughs> I, know. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, you guys, and and now more than ever. We need these practices. You bet. Yeah. We need her to hold our hand through this. And well, I, she will. Yeah, she will. She is. And even yeah, when we have doubt, she is still there. Yeah. Ask her to show up and she'll show up. People, you know, people sometimes say, like, I asked her to show up and then I noticed my neighbor just put out a statue of the Virgin Mary in her lawn. You know, it happens. <laughs> Funny how that works. Yeah. Oh. Clark and Perdita, thank you so much for being here and for sharing your wisdom, sharing your faith, your devotion, your love of Our Lady. Um, it, is, it is just what sweet, sweet nectar and what a bomb you have brought us today. I am so grateful. So I'd love for people to know how can they find you? How can they reach you? There are a bunch of different ways. We have a website, wayoftherose.org, that has a lot of information on it. And needless to say, we have a book that's out there in the world, um, Way of the Rose, A Radical Path of the Divine Feminine Hidden in the Rosary. And the last thing we have is a Facebook group, an incredibly lively, we call it a kind of wild, untamed forest that's very kind and loving of people all over the world who share one thing in common, which is a devotion to the lady. And a desire to rewild the rosary. <laughs> it is a lovely community, I will say. I am very grateful to be to be participating in it and be part of it. And the Novena groups and what we are doing with the novenas is like nothing short of miraculous. It, that is that is going to be our next book is going to be on the novenas and that path of prayer. And it, it we have a miracle book as well up on the website. We update people can read. And, and what is the website address? Wayoftherose.org. 
Excellent. Wayofthe-rose.org, you guys, and go buy this book. It's amazing. It is truly amazing. As we come to the end of this episode, I'd love to hear what you're taking from this show. Please jump over to empathicmasteryshow.com to leave your comments. In the show notes, you'll find a link to grab your copy of My Empathic Safety Guide, Three Basics for Finding Calm in the Eye of the Storm. And while you're there, please subscribe and follow this show. And thank you for your help sharing this show with the people who need it. Please help me to spread the word and send this podcast to friends or family members who need support living as highly sensitive empathic people. Then join me again when the next Empathic Mastery Show airs. Okay, one last time. Hop over to EmpathicMasteryShow.com for your empathic safety guide. And until next show, shine on. We need you and your gifts here on this planet. So please don't judge your empathic rainbow by colorblind standards.